the clinical manifestations that can be encountered in patients of baby aneurysm. The first and the foremost thing that could be written in the MCQ and a patient might say would be worst headache of my life. Now if this phrase is written then uh, things will become relatively easier for you because he has given you a diagnosis right away. So most of the time after writing this phrase he will not ask you the diagnosis but he might talk about the workup and the management of the patient. In some MCQ, especially American books, you will read this word thunderclap headache. That's a very peculiar term, I would say, and very rarely would you find Indian patients using the word thunderclap headache per se. Now, what do you mean by thunderclap headache is that once the headache will start, it achieves a peak intensity as early as by one minute and it usually lasts up to five minutes. So thunderclap headache as the name suggests is a short duration headache. It would last up to maybe few minutes. You know, I'm just saying uh, usually the medical literature says lasts up to five minutes. That's not a hard and a fast rule can last longer in a sense that then it might be a dull headache. You know the severity which was associated initially might gradually taper off. But the surprising thing is the peak intensity is obtained within one minute. Now, if you ever had headache in your life, you know, maybe you skipped your breakfast or maybe you were too stressed out, the headache tends to gradually peak and then you start feeling very terrible and then you have lack of concentration. Here, it's like everything is very sudden. Like patient was watching television, the question get bigger by describing a young female like working on a laptop or watching television, new watching election coverage, something, something. And then suddenly there's a this excruciating headache developing in a patient. This would be associated with the development of features of raised ICT. So it's the sudden onset raised ICT that explains the fact that why the headache is so bad. And in fact, there have been instances when patients have become stuporous. There have been instances when patients have become comatose for days altogether and then have unfortunately died. I mean, I gave you a incidence of 45% for uh, uh, the possibility of death in these conditions, which is exceptionally high considering that we doctors call ourselves so tech savvy and then we are having a mortality range to that higher level. So obviously the standard features of uh, uh, vomiting would be present in the patient. This would be associated with development of a patient having features of raised ICT, which would result in development of forceful vomiting in a patient. And in some cases, the headache can be so severe that patient might lose consciousness. There might be LOC or a loss of consciousness or patient might become stuporous. So these are all related to development of uh, increase in the intracranial pressure of the patient. Uh, do remember the fact that because the blood will irritate the meninges, like, like you know that in meningitis, there would be a development of pus irritating the meninges causing a nuchal rigidity. In this question also, there would be a nuchal rigidity or a neck stiffness which is described. Uh, in the CNS infection part, I have said it but I'll just repeat that again. If you get a triad which is talking about fever, which is talking about a headache and then talks about nuchal rigidity, then you need to think in terms of meningeal infection. You have to think in terms of meningitis in a patient. But in subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, there is no fever present though there is a splitting sudden onset headache which might be called as thunderclap headache. So if three things are given together like this it is bacterial meningitis but if we, if I remove the fever and then you introduce a thunderclap manifestation it obviously goes in favor of subrecord hemorrhage as a diagnosis. Now what are other conditions in which thunderclap headache can be present? Obviously one of the causes is subrecord hemorrhage. I'll first just mention before you some of the miscellaneous causes which could be present. It could be post -coital. Uh, it could be exertional headache like uh, somebody did bench press or somebody is doing very heavy dumbbells. So after an extremely strenuous workout, there could be a splitting headache that could be occurring in a patient. Uh, that exceptionally severe headache that occurs could be described as a thunderclap headache. Then after coughing, we can get uh, patients complaining of a very severe headache. So we do have some very... Uh, I would say conditions, non-specific ones for which we do not have definitive treatment also like a orgasmic, a exertional and a benign cough headache in a patient. But over and above this, the ones that you definitely need to remember are conditions of intracerebral hemorrhage. So even 
stroke can contribute to thunder clap headache in a patient so don't be under impression that it is only a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage it would could be intracerebral hemorrhage migraine is something which is always a diagnosis of exclusion when all other things have been ruled out so if imaging is fine i could think in terms of migraine also contributing to subarachnoid hemorrhage which is very well given there but prior to that i will think about another dangerous condition hypophyseal apoplexy what do you mean by apoplexy is bleeding in the pituitary so i want you to remember bleeding in the meninges bleeding in the pituitary brain hemorrhage bleeding three areas i repeat again subarachnoid brain hemorrhage and pituitary apoplexy must be ruled out before you think in terms of other less common causes including migraine which could be contributing to development of a thunderclap headache in a patient other could be or other causes could be like dissection of the cerebral vessels sphenoid sinus or sinusitis or it could be uh, written as uh, cortical sinus thrombosis and then a, a reversible vasospasm of the brain which is uh, i would say a condition which is harmless or benign so i would not worry about them but the ones that i have tick marked here before you including uh, the development of cortical sinus or cavernous sinus thrombosis we definitely have to think in terms of a possibility of a thunderclap headache so these are causes of thunderclap headache that could be occurring in a patient moving ahead when berry aneurysm will rupture or for that matter of fact any sacular aneurysm will rupture in the brain the clinical manifestations will also depend upon which area the rupture has occurred like they have shown or documented in clinically practice that uh, if the berry at the most common site that i was talking about that is anterior communicating artery site will rupture then you could be having features related to speech deficits why because this blood vessel is going to be related to the frontal lobe and uh, frontal lobe damage blood supply damage can cause ebullia meaning of the word ebullia is lack of desire to speak or they could be aphasia which could be broca's aphasia because uh, the broca's area is located in the inferior frontal lobe that is where the anterior communicating artery is traversing and uh, yeah the blood supply to the corticospinal pathway can be hampered so they could even be hemiparesis developing in a patient so focal neurological deficits can also be written in the multiple choice question of patients of subarachnoid hemorrhage if the berry aneurysm is located at the posterior communicating artery then very close to the posterior communicating artery is the oculomotor nerve so do not be surprised if in a multiple choice question you have features of third nerve palsy written uh, with respect to our ruptured berry aneurysm in fact this is itself a question so i'll just mention it here the question has been what is the commonest cranial nerve involved in a case of unruptured berry the answer is oculomotor nerve it is the most common nerve which is involved with respect to a unruptured berry then they have asked what is the commonest cranial nerve that is involved in case of a ruptured berry aneurysm the answer would still be given as third nerve palsy in a patient the point i'm trying to make here is that if unruptured will press on the third nerve then ruptured will also press on the third nerve why you should know this is because lot of guides have answered a sixth nerve palsy thinking that raised ict will contribute to a development of sixth nerve palsy i agree to the fact that the commonest cranial nerve which is involved in raised ict is the sixth nerve because it has the longest subarachnoid course so because the sixth nerve has the longest subarachnoid course when the pressure in the brain will rise it will cause the stretching of the sixth nerve and that would contribute to sixth nerve palsy in a patient but at the moment we talking about a berry which is unruptured pressing on the third so therefore third nerve palsy manifestations in the form of uh, development of uh, loss of light reflex on that particular side contralateral light reflex would be preserved but there would be loss of light reflex on that particular side there could be retro orbital pain that could be associated with the a berry located at this area with papillary dilatation obviously because there is a loss of light reflex so features of third nerve palsy could be given in the question then if the berry aneurysm involves the internal carotid artery now internal carotid artery traverses the cavernous sinus if you remember anatomy uh, there are multiple cranial nerves that go through cavernous cavernous sinus like cranial nerve number 3 4 5 6 3 4 5 are present laterally and the sixth nerve is a free floating structure internal carotid artery and the sixth nerve is the free floating structure with respect to a cavernous sinus if you have a berry with respect to the ica it could contribute to pressure on the sixth nerve and therefore sixth nerve palsy is seen with patients who are having a, 
uh, uh, development of uh, berry aneurysm with respect to the internal carotid artery in the cavernous sinus. Uh, do remember my words, raise SRT also causes six nerve palsy, but if per se, uh, you know, I am, this time I'm not talking about any false localizing sign. Uh, let me, let me explain this uh, once again to you so that it's clear. You see guys, raise SRT is a condition where the pressure in the subarachnoid space is more, so the sixth nerve is going to be stretched. The problem is not in the sixth nerve in raise SRT, the problem is in the subarachnoid space. Sixth nerve is innocently a bystander which got involved, so that's why we call it a false localizing sign because disease was not in the sixth nerve and it was just that it was innocently got involved but this time i am having a proper berry which is gonna press on the sixth nerve and uh, therefore this sixth nerve palsy would not be called as a false localizing sign this is a genuine feature with a diplopia occurring on uh, looking laterally if uh, we are having a berry which is uh, having its location in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery pica is a branch of the vertebral or aica which is a branch of the basilar artery then you could also be having this mcq mentioning regarding occipital headache and even a cervical headache that is pain with respect to a cervical pain in fact i would say cervical area i would mean is area behind the head just below the occiput so cervical area pain might also be described in the multiple choice question so these are some variants that can be introduced in the question just to throw you off the track the bottom line is focal neurological deficits can be given in a question of a berry aneurysm and then last but not the least they can also be a definitive risk of seizures well why seizures would occur in this condition uh, i would like to mention the fact that this medical condition is associated with release of BNP, B-type natriuretic peptide, and that B-type natriuretic peptide can contribute to development of natriuresis and loss of sodium from the body. Because of the loss of sodium from the body, the patient could be having a dangerous hyponatremia. You are all aware normal sodium is 135 to 145 milliequivalents. If sodium goes less than 125 milliequivalents, then it can contribute to development of a dyselectrolytemia and a seizures in a patient. So do not be surprised if you find the word seizures written in patients of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Let me make it clear. You see in subarachnoid hemorrhage, we are not having any irritation of the brain parenchyma with the blood. It is rather electrolyte imbalance which could be contributing to it and lots of time the posturing that could be occurring in the patient might be also misdiagnosed as a patient having a convulsion by the relative. So posturing definitely indicates again a brain herniation indicates a raised acidity which is occurring in this patient and uh, to top it all there is a possibility that the relative might tell you or if this person will recover later then the same person would tell you that few days earlier i was watching television and suddenly had this excruciating headache i just felt as if my head will explode so sentinel headache history may or may not be elicited but this would have occurred before the actual episode where the berry simply popped off and you had was a deterioration of this particular patient